good morning, everyone. It's very good to be with you. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. And uh, though it has been some years since I myself was in college, uh, I feel like I can relate on a number of fronts, at least with what college students, I believe, are very much known for. Uh, both when I was in college, well, there are a couple differences, and you uh, today. So uh, yes, we're going to be talking about the care of the soul, but I want to set it in a bigger context. Because if you're anything like me, the biggest question I often have is, so why should I bother? Why should I bother with various core important spiritual practices? I know I see them in Jesus' life, and I know I see them in the scriptures and from spiritual writings down through the centuries, but why exactly would I postpone other things that are really, really important in my life in order to connect with God? Isn't he with me always? Do I really need to be that intentional with it? So my hope is to convince you <laughs> that that indeed would be a very good use of your time. Whatever form you choose, whatever way you can care for your soul by putting it into connection with God, whatever form, that's, that's really up to you between you and God and your connections, friends, soul friends that help you figure that kind of stuff out. But the most important thing is deciding that that's the way you want to live. Even here at Wheaton. Even here at Wheaton. So I want to talk to you about a couple things that when I think of college students, what are they known for? Um, I've learned this. This is not the same as when I was in college. Here's a new thing I've discovered that college students are known for. And that is, well, we all knew all-nighters, right? Are you known for all-nighters, anybody here? You're not admitting to it. <laughs> this is chapel. You have to be honest. All right, any all-nighters? All right, a few honest ones. Well, here's what I learned that's new. I knew that about college students. I did a fair share myself. Um, but I found out that uh, college students actually have a new kind of all-nighter, the guitar hero all-nighter. <laughs> right? Isn't that true? Yes, and now that the Beatles guitar hero is coming out, I can imagine there will be a few more all-nighters. Um, I also think uh, college students are known for Starbucks, yes? Any other? Yes, yes, yes. We can have a, just a moment of silence and appreciation for Starbucks. It is one of the core spiritual practices. <laughs> yes, you can quote me on that even. Um, but I think there's another thing that college students uh, years ago, perhaps centuries ago, and even today are well known for and for good reason. And that's that they typically have a huge desire to change the world. College students I know now, college students I've known over the years, and I'm guessing a fair number of people in this room, I hope a lot of you, have as a dream, a desire, to be part of a world being very different than what it is right now. And I believe the, the world around us is in desperate need of intelligent, articulate, loving, and hardworking Christians who can show up and take places of leadership and influence in government, in medicine, in academia, in so many different areas that you are all studying right now. And this is important for you to do this and take this dead serious because there are massive problems, as even you were praying about, there are massive problems in the world right now that need boatloads of God's wisdom and strength and virtue brought to all these different dimensions of our lives, and yes, also to the church. Many of you may be preparing for ministry and all that kind of stuff. Now, when I was in college, I too wanted to change the world. Um, I actually and I went to a very secular university, Cornell University. It's up in New York State. And like Wheaton, it's a very rigorous academic environment and uh, very demanding, very challenging, very, uh, well, that's for the all-nighters, right? That's why we do that. And, uh, and yet, while I was in college, I was invited to a Bible study by an ex-boyfriend. You know how this works out. And uh, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. There's a fun story. There's a fun end to that story. But um, my, uh, this friend of mine, he was on the lacrosse team. Uh, he invited me to attend a Bible study. And he had to persuade me that the people there were normal. Um, that took a little convincing at first. But I trusted him. And I went to a Bible study that was being held at the Sigma Chi fraternity house. And uh, I grew up in a family of faith, but I did not hang out with peers, friends, who were serious about the things of God. I didn't 
I knew my parents and their friends, this was important to them, and I knew I had a growing belief in my own heart, but I didn't ever have conversations with friends who were talking to me about this stuff. And so I sat in that little fraternity room, which now we've taken our children to, and it's like really disgusting. And you're like, how did God ever work in there? How do we live in these places when we're in college? But just enjoy it, love it. I'm sure your apartment is fine. Um, <laughs> um, but in any case, God moved. God moved, and our hearts were warmed toward the things of God, towards each other, and towards the thought of being involved in God's activities in this world. And that is a captivating vision. That is a captivating vision for every single one of us to say, might I be part of it? Might I be part of what God is doing both now and into the future? That is a very important thing. However, here's what I've also learned. Um, we did go into ministry, by the way. I ended up marrying the guy who was leading that Bible study. And, uh, and, and the one who invited me was, yes, the best man in our wedding and very good friends, uh, even to this day. So hang on to those friends and make sure you date people you won't mind hanging out with later. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole chapel service in and of itself. Well, <laughs> you can invite me back for another topic on that one. <laughs> But here's the scoop. Um, we ventured into ministry and uh, gave our whole hearts to that. My husband attended a seminary. We were interns for a year at Willow Creek Community Church and went into Boston to do some church planting, to start our own work. Yes, thank you. One New Englander in the building. Uh, we went to Boston uh, because we felt called to that area of the country and to the, the idea of bringing the message of Jesus Christ to a place that doesn't have a lot of options, as many at least in places like this, to hearing a compelling voice for the biblical story. So uh, we went, um, and I wanna tell you a little story about what happened right when we first got there and then how that relates to my own story and I hope to yours. Um, any of you guys runners? Couple, okay. Any marathon runners? Come on, raise that hand up. I see one, two, good, awesome, impressive. So you'll know a little bit more than maybe everybody else about the, what's special about Boston. Um, Boston's known for a lot of things, but one of them is that there's a marathon that goes through every April, the Boston Marathon, it's a clever title. And uh, there's some things that are unique about the Boston Marathon. You know, every marathon has the same distance, right? 26 some odd miles. But the Boston Marathon is considered one of the most elite marathons in the world because, not the distance is any different, but because of the topography, right? The elevation. The Boston Marathon, uh, for the first few miles, probably about till mile 18 or 19, it's, you know, up and down, a little bit of this and that. But when you hit mile 19 in the Boston Marathon, you start what is ultimately about a six mile incline toward the finish line, okay? So that starts at, it goes up and down a little bit, but it overall, you get a little bit of a reprieve for the last mile, but that part has a name. Mile 19, it was right around near where we lived in Boston. So we went out to go watch at mile nine, or 21. It starts at mile 19, we lived at mile 21. So my husband and I were invited by our neighbors to go watch the Boston Marathon. And the, oh, and I didn't tell you the name of that, that stretch. Does anybody know it, the name of the stretch between 19, mile 19 and 25 in the Boston Marathon? Heartbreak Hill. Heartbreak Hill. That's right, that's exactly right. Now you can imagine why, right? Because at mile 20, what's gonna happen? They hit the wall, right? You know, any runner in any marathon, you get to mile 20, you hit the wall. So we're at mile 21, and these runners are moving higher and higher to get up to that finish line. The other thing about the Boston Marathon is you can't even run the Boston Marathon unless you get a qualifying time from another marathon. So this is the most elite runners that are running. So my husband and I are out watching, and it's like a party scene on Commonwealth Avenue in Boston. I mean, big, huge homes and hundreds and hundreds of people, and you, you know, see the wheelchair competitors go through, and the crowd goes crazy. And then the media trucks, and you can hear the helicopter are coming through, and we know the male front runners are coming next. And as we're watching, you can kind of see in the distance, the number one, two, three, four runners are starting to come towards us, and the crowd erupts. Everybody's going crazy for it. 
And um, as these runners were approaching us, one of them really caught my eye. And um, I I'm not myself a runner, but here's what caught my eye. This guy was kind of running a little bit this way, and then he was running a little bit that way. And I'm thinking, I'm no runner, but it seems like a straight line would probably be the fastest way to get to the end. <laughs> and, um, but you know, you, sort, it, you know how you, when you see something that looks different than everything else, it catches your eye. And I noticed it, but very quickly you could see this was not funny because this man was losing his, his sensibilities. He was, he was stumbling, and he was trying to keep moving and trying to keep moving this way and that. And as it turned out, you know, I had noticed him, but he started running closer and closer to actually where we were standing, and we had to kind of move back a little bit as he came forward and literally tumbled into the front yard of the home we were standing in front of. And his, he's, you know, shaking, and his eyes are rolling back in his head, and thank God, the, uh, the medical people had had their eye on him as well. They were watching, and they knew, and were there right away with an ambulance, and you know that tinfoil that they wrap you up in? So they wrapped him up in the tinfoil and, and took him off, and later we did find out that he survived. His life wasn't threatened, but he was out of that race for that day. Now that man was one of the top runners in the world. He was probably maybe 10th or 11th by the time he got to mile 21 of the Boston Marathon. So it's not like he wasn't a good runner. He was one of the world's best. And he went on to run other races for sure. But I had no idea as I sat there looking at this poor, amazing athlete sort of twitching in the tinfoil, I had no idea what a picture that was of my life and where I was headed. I was headed for my own heartbreak hill, but I didn't know it. I didn't know it. We were relatively young. We had had training from some of the best organizations and schools. In a sense, my husband and I, and I'll just speak for myself at this point, we were kind of those elite runners in the kingdom. And we know from Hebrews that God has given each of us a race that we're supposed to run with great perseverance and throw aside anything that hinders. And the metaphor of a race is a good one for us. But for me, in that season, I was headed for my own heartbreak hill, and I had no idea. What that looked like in my life is that after a season of a lot of exertion, a lot of leading, a lot of doing, a lot of running and helping other people, but without a way of life that kept me connected to God in real time, my reserves were getting so depleted, and I had no idea. Like that guy, I hadn't found a pace to run that, allowed, that was sustainable. And I ended up suffering some pretty severe physical symptoms and getting literally sidelined from my own life for quite some time. And in that time, I was kind of confused. It's like, God, I know all these truths about you. I believe in you, and I'm kind of on your team. Why am I sidelined? What, what gives? What's wrong with this? And the best answer I had then, and I've studied a lot more about it to this day and learned more, but the best answer I have is that I had neglected, not by intention, but I had neglected the well-being of my own soul, precisely in the midst of trying to do the work of God. Now that is not a picture of what John the Apostle writes about in John 15, 5. And many of you know this verse, where John's, you know, Jesus is laying out a metaphor. I'm the vine, he says, and you're the branch. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. We love that. We kind of sometimes stop there. Like, okay, we want to be all about the fruit bearing. But then the next part of the verse says something else. Apart from me, you can do nothing. nothing. And I sensed God kind of saying to me during this season of being sidelined, you know, Mindy, what part of nothing didn't you understand? Now, when I went to, in college, our, our college has an agriculture school and uh, people were horticulture majors. I don't know if any of you are horticulture majors, but the, the metaphor Jesus is using here is pretty, pretty obvious. Anybody can get it, right? He's a vine and we're a branch. To the extent to which you stay connected to that in real time, not just like sort of connected to it once and you believe in it and then you go sit somewhere else. If you are real time connected to that source of life, the life flow flows into you and through you, and that's how fruit gets born. We have a tree in the backyard of our house, 
that a big severe windstorm came through uh, about a year ago and, uh, and lopped off a branch that was basically like half the tree. So now if you look in our backyard, there's a tree that's, you know, kind of goes straight up like this and then has a nice little tree. This side's gone. <laughs> when that half of the tree fell off, it didn't stop looking green and vibrant right away. And that was very interesting to me. It took us a couple days to find a chainsaw and go hack it apart. But it still looked green. The leaves, it looked like it was still alive. It took some time before the fact that it had been detached actually showed up. And I think that's part of the struggle for us as Jesus' people, is that yes, we're connected to him forever and for always. Through the work of the cross, eternally we're his. But right here, right now, how is it that you stay connected to that vine? What does that look like for you? Do you know how it feels in your soul when that connection is strong? And do you know how it feels when it starts to deteriorate? Can you pay attention to that? Do you notice it? Or do you, like I did, just keep barreling through? For me, I, the reason I ended up twitching in the tinfoil of my own life was that I ignored, absolutely ignored, every single symptom that my soul might be in trouble. Push through it, that was what I knew to do in life. But there were utterly predictable symptoms, and I believe there are predictable symptoms in all of us. It's kind of an interesting exercise to do, to say, you know, what is it that when you've lost that sense of connection with God, how do you start to feel, think, respond? Come on, a couple brave people. When you've lost a sense of connection with God, let's be honest, we don't mean for it to happen, but it does. Life gets busy, we get running and gunning, and we've lost that sense of connection with God. And when we do, the world starts to look a certain way. Anybody have an idea? Like what, how do we start to feel and think and relate when we've lost connection with God? Apathy? Excellent, absolutely. Overwhelmed, terrific. Worry, anxiety, get really loud like she was. <laughs> okay, now not all at once. All right, so maybe this won't work, but you get the idea. You turn to your person next to you and say, here's a symptom of soul neglect. Quickly, go. Whatever you were thinking. <laughs> all right, now come on back. Come on back. You don't get a half an hour for this. You want to be out at 11.15 too, right? All right, so here, that, we don't mean for that to happen, but it's a, it's a reality of the soul, that your soul thrives when it's, in, when it's in connection with God, not just knowing truths about God. We're all good on that. I'm talking about real-time connection with God. Okay, so I want you to think about the other way. When you've been in a place of deep connection with God, now it could be a time that was supported by different spiritual practices or relationships in your life, or when you had a sense of God being with you, God being for you, right here, right now, that's what I'm after, it could have been a time, again, that was really kind of, um, you, you had a way of life and spiritual practices that were encouraging that, or it could have been a time in your life when like the wheels are coming off, all hell is breaking loose, and somehow, in the midst of that, you know God is with you. Can you anchor into your mind a time in your own life when you knew God was with you. Think of it in your own, your own story. It could be right now, could have been some time ago, but a time when you sensed God's presence. Now I want you to turn to the person next to you and tell them what kind of person were you? What flowed out of you automatically? Think about it for a second and then we're gonna turn. Can you come up with something that came out of who you were? Not because you were trying, like joy when you try to make it happen generally doesn't. I'm talking about what naturally came out of you during a time when your sense of God's presence with you was quite strong. All right, now turn to someone and say, what kind of person were you then?
All right. Calling you back, calling you back, calling you back. It's a pretty big difference between what our soul's like when we've lost touch with God and what our soul is like when we're in connection with God. And here is how this all ties back to what it means to be a person who is, has a dream of changing the world and can actually go and be part of that. Because the school you're entered into now can teach you a lot of things. But the school that all of us have to go into is the school of transformation, where we are in a school of becoming. The assignments God has for you, the dreams he's given to you are so important they are so vital that it's essential for every single one of us to live into and to become the people who can, who can achieve those assignments by his power, under his grace. But part of the reason that I had my own, I think, sort of wake-up call to this was so that I could enter into a different kind of learning, learning a way of life, of keeping my soul connected with God, moment by moment, so that I could live into those very real dreams he had given me. Your dreams matter. They're not just your invented thing. They are part of what God has put in you. But in order for those dreams to find their place in this very needy world, you're gonna have to, and I, every single person in this room, we have got to become the people God has for us to become to live into those dreams. And to do that, you're gonna to have to learn how to care for your soul. To put your soul in a place, whether it's through solitude, prayer, spiritual friendships, the time engaged in God's scripture, not to just acquire knowledge, as important as that is, but to allow God to shape and form you into the people he's calling you to be. I hope you'll take whatever step that is, even today. Even right now, you can listen to me sort of as we wrap this up, and you can be saying, God, I just want to connect with you right now. Thank you for being here. I'm confused about this. I'm worried about that. Just connect with him. All right. Are you in? I'd like to really think, I'd really like to think that you will make this as a choice to say that dream is so important, I got to learn how to sit and be quiet with God and allow him to do whatever God needs to do at the inside of my world to live into that dream. So let's all stand up and I'll pray. God, I'm kind of blown away, blown away to think about the dreams that are just under this roof right now. And the families that will be healed and, and created and the discoveries that would be made the solutions that would be found to massive world challenges and to the challenges of, of small everyday life. But whatever those are, God, I pray that your hand would lead every single person in this room to pursue your heart with openness and diligence so that we can live into that verse of throwing aside anything that gets in the way of us running that race that you've marked out for us. We pray this in Jesus' strong name and for his sake. Amen.